when Wilbur and Orville Wright first took to the air at Kitty Hawk in December 1903, one of the age-old dreams of mankind had at last been realized. Australia, with its vast distances and small population, quickly recognized the advantages of this new form of transport. And by 1910, John Deegan had designed and flown Australia's first aircraft. A year later, the Australian Flying Corps was established and a flying school founded at Point Cook to supply pilots for these lumbering machines. Flying was an adventure when the only rules were to improvise and get back onto the ground, hopefully in one piece. The exploits of the aviation pioneers quickly captured the interest of Australians and the conquest of the air became a magnet for young men. Today, pilots of the Royal Australian Air Force fly some of the most technologically developed aircraft in the world, but still have that adventurous spirit of aviation's pioneers. For in spite of all the state-of-the-art equipment, aircraft are only as good as their pilots. Australia has a worldwide reputation for the quality of her pilots. This is not just some natural tray, but the result of an extremely tough and rigorous basic flying course, conducted at the original number one flying school, Point Cook, and at Pierce, Western Australia. Each year, an average of 150 students begin the basic flying course, but only 50% meet the requirements of the challenge of flight. The greatest moment was the presentation of the wings, the wing ceremony. That was a culmination of 18 months of solid effort. The two highlights of any pilot's career occur during the basic flying course. The first solo flight and the presentation of wings, which signifies that the cadet has graduated as a fully qualified pilot. It's a great relief to have the studies behind you. I'm proud that I've been able to achieve something both for myself and for my parents. Uh, they've, they've worked hard at giving me a reasonable education and I'm lucky to have had the chance to do the course and to finally get to the parade ground and, and receive a set of wings. Great, I've done it at last. All the work seemed worthwhile. I felt as though I was walking on air. It was the most fantastic feeling I've ever had. I was one of the people who did struggle through the course. I found it very difficult. The course begins at Point Cook near Melbourne where new entrants are first schooled to become officers in the Royal Australian Air Force. Point Cook's a bit of a shock when you first arrive there. You arrive there with 14, 15 other blokes as green as you are, and before you know it, you just rush into a system. I'd like to welcome you here to Point Cook this morning on your first day in the Air Force. Now we'll go into a little bit of a spiel. I had spiel never had anything to do with the Air Force before. I didn't know what was going on. Commanding officer, I would like to welcome you to the RAF and to Officer's Training School. I didn't know who I was in terms of everybody else around me, where I stood, but we were very, uh, very quickly told where we stood, at the bottom. <laughs> ATS, you could compare to like being at school, where you're in there doing lectures, everything is given to you, and it's learn, 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 and sit for an exam. And the testing is constant, for the future pilot will be an officer who must learn to discipline himself before he can control others. At first I wasn't really enjoying it actually, I didn't realise it was going to be so much work. I didn't think there was so much involved in becoming a pilot. It all seems so far from flying. The officer's training course is a concentrated ten-week indoctrination into the military way of life. It was a 7.30 start and you normally finished at 5, sometimes at 6 and every night you had to do two, two and a half hours in your own time preparation. Yeah, when am I ever going to get there and you're sitting there doing all this paperwork at OTS and you just think, oh, this isn't what I joined for. You had to look after yourself too, keep the blocks clean and all that sort of domestic type scene. And it's little chores like these that begin to meld the individual students into a cohesive group. The people in it help each other and that's the main reason why a lot of us are going to get through. 
Right, and you're sort of, they're living together, working together, breathing together, trying to help each other in bad times and rejoicing in the good times type thing. The spirit <laughs> and the morale that you get amongst these guys is just quite rewarding. I hated the place. I can remember quite distinctly feeling very sorry that I even got on pilot's course. I appreciated what it was all about, but I didn't like it at all. I enjoyed the bivouac. Uh, it was great. It only rained once for four days. So there was a lot of marching and a lot of bushwalking and you know, there was painting mud on your faces and all this sort of stuff. Oh, God. Blue Forces Hold Hill 234, which is... It was the first time in our entire training when we were treated like people rather than numbers. The officers we went with made it quite clear that we were being examined, but they did show some leniency towards that and they started calling us by our first names and realised that we have showers and we have to show them. We had realised the same things about them, so we were on an equal basis. Not equal, but a more equal living standard. The bivouac signals the end of officers' training school. It's the practical side of the course where leadership, initiative, navigation and survival are assessed with the rest of the grades. Successful cadets are posted to the number one flying training school, also at Point Cook. Which I was really looking forward to. All the, all the instructors were pilots and people you could relate to a little bit more. OTS, their job is to teach us how to be officers. FTS have got a task, teach us how to fly. Good morning, gentlemen. This morning I'd like to formally welcome you collectively as a pilot's course to number one FTS. We're now going to learn to fly an aeroplane. Not all would-be flyers are in the Air Force. The flying school operates on a tri-service multinational basis and cadets from the Air Force are joined by students from the Army, Navy and from neighbouring countries. The Air Force works on a different language to the normal society. The instructor was up there talking his language, even though it's English. So it was just like being in another country, to tell you the truth. Alien to me, but um, you realise that the last it was to do was flying, and we started to look on it in that respect. You do tend to get to the stage where you think, am I ever going to know it? It's like learning to walk, you keep falling over for a while, then all of a sudden you stand up and off you go, you never stop. And to keep that momentum is the job of the instructors, young pilots themselves. The interaction I had with my instructor made my time there. Had I had a different instructor, I probably would have disliked it even. You build up a sort of rapport with your own instructor, and you get to know him, and he gets to know you. More so than I think you get to know him. As a group of men, they're fantastic. Very helpful and very friendly. I think that's the way they want to try and put it across, so they can get the most out of you without you feeling anxious or, or nervous, because they realise that, that you've got a hard job ahead of you. And uh, you seem to give yourself enough trouble as it is, without uh, them adding to the burden. I was quite impressed with the instructors, actually. But they have to push you very close to your limits. And he, he's there, in reality, to, to pass you. He's not there to scrub you. OK, here we go. Rolling. After the first two weeks, we were into the aircraft, up flying around. And this is why I was here, as far as I was concerned. But the first thrill of flying is quickly turned into reality. You really are in an environment that potentially can kill you. And you're relying on your own judgment, and your own skill and knowledge to see you through the day. I didn't enjoy my flying very much until I got on top of everything. Because you're, you've got checks to do and you've got to do them exactly. If you don't, then the instructor is going to get upset and could, the end result is you could get scrubbed if you, if you end up too bad. Instructors haven't got an easy job. Air Force standards are high and limited time is available to achieve them. Instructors are constantly alert for the slightest fault. This is unnerving for the cadet, but there is relief and some apprehension when after 10 or more hours of flying with instructors, the cadets face their first solo flight. And we'll take him back in and okay, he just said... Okay, you're going to go on solo. Any questions? I thought, ah, wow. Uh, no questions, sir. I'm a bit nervous, sir. Oh, don't worry about it. Just talk yourself or sing a song as you go. Okay, sir. Uh, now I'm going to uh, exit the aircraft. 
And the instructor gets out of the aircraft and you lift off and you're on your own and you've got this you know, sort of calm piece of machinery. The responsibility is on one person and that's yourself. You've got the aircraft, you have to fly it, you have to land it, there's no handing over. All of a sudden, it's, it's on your shoulders. It's Knowing that it's only you and there's a very vacant seat next to you. But the, the elation that you have once the wheels leave the ground, you could almost cry out with pleasure. First it's just, I just yahooed all the way around the circuit. Because when you're up there on your own, with nobody looking over your shoulder, you've got nothing to worry about. When you're completely confident with everything that you're doing, you can just completely enjoy the three-dimensional movement through the elements. I just thought it was great. Couldn't wait to go back to the crew and, and say to everyone I've been solo, and couldn't wait also to phone up my dad and tell him because I knew it would be a fairly big occasion for him seeing he was a pilot also. Well, I was relieved to get back on the ground with the things they terrified in the air. And once I, I had done it, I, I just felt elated because I, I had accomplished something that I wanted, wanted to accomplish for so long. And I just didn't have any thoughts at all about being scrubbed or any negative ideas whatsoever. Suspension rate since 1903, when Wilbur and Orville Wright had a go at it, was 50%, and it's been 50% ever since. The course is like a big family. I think when someone's scrubbed, you think that you're losing one of the members of the family. Debriefing held after each flight can hold terror for the students who are aware that at any moment they could be suspended from the course. The main reason for scrubbing is failure to reach the flying standards required. The Air Force does not encourage cowboys. Come in, Peter. Well, mate, that wasn't a very good performance, was it? No, sir. You knew before we went flying today that uh, your performance is in the past. And we all feel sorry been... for the person. All that brilliant. But, uh, the Air Force, in its infinite and wisdom, has chosen not to continue with its training. It made the students realise that it, all, it wasn't going to be a piece of cake. And, satisfactory. and after discussions with the CO, I'm going to have to recommend your suspension. We can't do anything about it except consult him. something that I do Wish likely. him luck in his whatever he chooses. The Institute of Aviation Medicine at Point Cook. Here, students experience and learn about the physiological problems of flight. What they're trying to achieve is to give you an awareness on the ground of the problems that you can have when you're airborne. It's a claustrophobic feeling. Being inside the chamber, it's almost like being at the bottom of the ocean. And it lets you feel the effects of, of what it's like in that environment without oxygen. We it affects different people in different ways. We had to write down how we actually felt. So the first thing I wrote down was felt good because I just felt good. Then about two or three minutes later I felt great, so I wrote great down. And after about another couple of moments, I tried to write fantastic but I couldn't spell it. They've got this ejection seat set up on rails. It gives the students the physical sensation they would feel in the unlikely event of their having to eject from their plane. And you feel this big boot up the pants and you're, all of a sudden you're 30 feet above the air looking out at everybody. up you feel like you're alone in the sky with the lights of Melbourne and the runway lights underneath you. The final test flights have been taken at Point Cook. By now the cadet has around 60 flying hours experience. 
I was quite glad to finish. <laughs> At last you start to feel like a, like a pilot, or almost like a pilot. It's time for the successful cadets to move to Pierce, Western Australia, for the last 32 weeks of the course, training on jets. Oh, that was a big move, very big move. The babying stage is over. This is for real. This is the stage where you have to come up with the goods. They're actually moulding you to the point where you can actually leave this place and go operational and be a captain of an aircraft. A jet is really quite unbelievable compared to a prop aircraft. There's so much more power, so there's, there's a big difference in performance. The Mackie is a lot more complicated. For example, there's retractable undercarriage and pressurisation, ejection seats, all that good gear. This is the final and longest part of the basic flying course. The routine is similar to Point Cook, with aircraft familiarisation and ground lectures. Not just the old thing of strapping into an aircraft and going flying. For every hour you'd spend in the air, you'd spend at least three on the ground easily. And that's the way it has to be, because you can't afford to learn in the air as such. You have to learn it on the ground and then apply it in the air. Of course, you can't sit in a room and imagine what it's going to be like when you're flying, but that's what you're trying for, ideally. So it was quite a surprise to go to Pierce and find the instructors very friendly and talking to you as an equal. As pilot to pilot, for the cadet has come to Pierce as an individual flyer. Flying is by numbers. Myself or any other member of the course can go up and we can do exactly the same flight. That's not individual in that respect. The satisfaction we get is individual. The Australian-built Mackie is a beautiful machine to fly. It's like a Rolls Royce, really, compared to the CT4. And for the student, it's easier to control. The basic principles of flying learnt at Point Cook still apply, regardless of the aircraft. Mackie's a wonderful aircraft, but I still haven't learnt to fly to the standard I want yet. Well, I have to aim high. The confidence in the machine is, is of paramount importance, I found. And, and that's what flying's all about, I think, really, is confidence. And it's that which gets the successful student through. Confidence in the instructors, the machines, and finally in himself. For the wing ceremony gives a great sense of personal achievement. So when I got my wings, after 18 months of um, really difficult work and study, frustrations and joys in there as well, it was kind of a fulfilment of probably the um, hardest phase of my life to date. Nobody flies through a pass course. Everyone has that, their hard times. And from these hard times comes maturity. I think everyone's changed. We're all about five years older than what we were a year ago. The standards of entry to the basic flying course are very high. Just to actually get the course is a big achievement in itself, the line passing. And when students fail, it affects the whole course. When you first come here to the Air Force, you're quite lonely, you're on your own, you don't know anybody else, nobody else knows you. You tend to get quite close to the other fellows. When you lose them then, it's very hard. And of course, the course bear it all together at the beginning and said, no, it couldn't happen to us, but uh, now we're down to six at the original 14. And this is average for the course. This distillation ensures that only the best survive to become pilots. But for those who didn't complete the course for whatever reason, the Air Force finds other uses for their talents. But for those who do succeed, the sky's the limit.